our eminent panelist and our distinguished moderator. I invite our moderator, Professor Sovik Bhattacharya, co-chair Fiki Higher Education Committee and senior vice president TCG Crest. Let's put our hands together to welcome sir. May I invite our eminent panelist? I would like to invite Professor Rangan Banerjee, Director, IIT Delhi. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Inviting Professor Atul Khosla, Vice Chancellor, Shulini University. A very warm welcome, sir. Inviting Professor Pavel Kuzmin, his Deputy Director for Academic Affairs and Digital Transformation, HSC University, St. Petersburg. Warm welcome. Inviting Dr. Bhaskar Roy, Global Operation Leader, Tata, Data Tech AI, GenPact. Warm welcome to you, sir. And Mr. Nishit Jain, he is Special Senior Advisor, Asia, EEF, MD, Global and EU. A warm welcome to you, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again requesting everybody to be seated. All mobile phones kept on to silent mode. A warm welcome to panel discussion session two, which is on the topic of nurturing innovation and entrepreneurship, higher education's role in driving disruption and fostering creativity. And ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished moderator for this session, Professor Sobik Bhattacharya, is currently the senior vice president of TCG Crest, a non-profit research institute. Previously, he served as the vice chancellor of Bitspilani for all its five campuses from 2016 to 23 the Vice-Chancellor of Jadavpur University, Kolkata, and Dean and Deputy Director of IIT Kharagpur, Kolkata. He was also a full-time faculty member at University of Canterbury, Christchurch, New Zealand during 1998 to 2000, visiting faculty at Rheinwald University, Germany, and a visiting fellow at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Texas, a and University, USA, 2014. He is an elected fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering, a National Academy of Science, India, and West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. He is a recipient of the Outstanding Teacher Award of Indian National Academy of Engineering. He has been conferred the Distinguished Alumnus Award by Texas A&M University, USA. And ladies and gentlemen, the time duration for the session is approximately one hour, 15 minutes which includes the opening and closing remarks by the distinguished moderator. And we will initially give five minutes to each of our eminent panelists, and which will be followed by an open house of 30 minutes. With those words, I hand over to our moderator for the opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. We are starting before time. So I hope a uh, few more people join us uh, as we get started gradually. Um, we've got a wonderful uh, session ahead of us. Uh, I'm very proud of the, the, the level and distinction and eminence of the, the panelists I have here today from academia, from industry, and from not academia, not industry, but something else as well, you know, consulting groups and uh, think tanks and, and so on. So <clears throat> let me start uh, with, uh, uh, of course, a, a sense of gratitude that we have been asked to do this session. And uh, I'll start with a quote from a book, uh, which uh, actually is a book that's used in some of the entrepreneurship related courses, particularly the one where I uh, used to work few months back. Uh, it's, it's titled, Where Good Ideas Come From. It's by uh, Stephen Johnson. And it says, I quote, if you look at history, innovation doesn't come just from giving people incentives. It doesn't come from incentives only. It comes from creating envir environments where their ideas can connect. So we are talking about, I'm going to sort of spread this, this thought in today's session in, in you know, multiple directions. We're talking about creating an ecosystem, an environment, rather than pointed uh, incentive that, you know, go to a student that if you do this startup, I'll do this to you, you know, that sort of, no. So 
we are talking about creating a, a you know independent of uh, any individual or anything so uh, and there are some good examples in this country maybe some of our panelists will point to that so we do need some agile some impactful ecosystems in this country and we are focusing on i'll refer to this again later possibly the the trinity of uh, the the academia the industry and the startups this this trinity is something that is a more recent trinity i would say and uh, we are going to have uh, this ecosystem at multiple levels um, so as i said not beyond uh, beyond those that trinity of government industry and academia we are talking about incubators which is probably part of the incubation system and consultants and, and venture capitalists and, and so on today this list is expanding at that that end and uh, the academia is rising up to that adjusting to that uh, the better ones have already done certain things so that the system is working in their institutes and campuses um, our institutes in our higher education institutions uh, they do play a pivotal role uh, that goes without saying in fostering a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship among our students um, and and sometimes our ecosystems go beyond our own students it helps students from other campuses also um, and this role is achieved through i mean this this impact will be achieved through uh, focused research and exploration so that question will also appear somewhere on the horizon that if a institute is not doing deep research will it not take any lead whatsoever in incubation efforts maybe you can that could be one of the questions and one of my panelists will answer uh, so by encouraging uh, disruptive thinking and providing practical tools these institutions empower aspiring entrepreneurs to transform imaginative concepts their ideas into impactful solutions uh, with a business model of course uh, reshaping industries and driving so societal progress as well some depending on the type of idea they have however this is a, a little bit of a sad story to to start with the resources we are deploying isn't enough according to many T generally in terms of research investment here are some not so happy stats if you will um, in most developed countries about 70 percent of the gross domestic expenditure on r d that's gerd according to some is contributed by the private sector that's about 70 percent of the gerd in most uh, developed countries um, you know we we need to do better but what's the number here in india it was about 36.4 percent in 2021 fy 21 uh, the government share was about 44 percent this obviously needs to change if we have to do better so we we will have these handicaps and still do well that's the expectation and we are also you know raising and making that noise that we need to do better on these stats as well uh, the private sector, primarily the industry sector, I think in the previous session um, on SDG, uh, we heard that the industry isn't possibly doing enough. And that didn't come from somebody in the academia. Um, needs, we need to re raise our R&D investment. In, there's another uh, sad number, I, I keep saying sad numbers. Um, in FY 2010, that's 13 years back, well, 14 years almost. R&D expenditure was about 0.82% of our GDP. Now, that wasn't very high, right? But lo and behold, it, it was followed by a steady decline in terms of percentage of GDP. And 0.64% is the number in FY21. So we are not doing better. Actually, we are getting into a darker zone. Um, so, so these... Uh, pictures are not going to help us but within india is a different kind of country and and we many of us most of us here we have we chose to work in this country and make a difference maybe we we have or we may not have so uh, the lot of talk goes on about collaboration toward the end of the maybe i i may not have a closing remark but i'll, I'll throw in an idea about a very different kind of collaboration model regarding research is showing up on the horizon which has not been practiced you know as widely as it should have been i'll talk about that a little later so uh, 
Of course, in recent times, some of the moves, uh, our colleagues will also talk about it if needed. The, the presence of, suddenly we have more professors of practice on campus because regulation does help. And that probably is helping in connecting us with the industry, in connecting us with, with uh, startups, et cetera. These professors of practice, they are not, uh, you know, having the mindset and the handicap that's, as we are always referred to, that academics have. So they come with a very strong business sense and, and then that will propel our ideas to something like a commercial venture, successful commercial venture. Um, we hear a, an, and read a great deal of recommendations across symposia, across conferences. Let me mention some. Um, industry and academia should jointly develop courses for, for knowledge translation and also promote directed and domain specific incubators jointly working with industry. That's one set of recommendations in the recent past. Restructure the postdoctorate culture for the Indian research ecosystem, industry led. Uh, PPP model, these are some of the ideas that, that uh, you know, percolate through. Envisage multiple funding mechanisms to strengthen the academia and so on. Not all of them, um, but let's try and cut through this this little bit of mystery and, and mist, if you will, as we listen to our distinguished panelists. Okay, so that's the little bit I was supposed to say to set the ball rolling. Now over to our panelists. Let me start with um, Atul, a dear friend, Professor Atul Koshla. Um, um, there is no introduction of the panelists. I, yeah, I think I'll, I'll request each panelist to, to just spend about 30 seconds or, or less than a minute uh, introducing uh, themselves. Uh, Atul is, of course, uh, uh, the, the you know, leading uh, a very interesting uh, research university, Shulin University in Himachal Pradesh, but the rest Atul will say. Um, let me just pose the question first, and then Atul will introduce and respond to the question. So. Um, you know, we, I, you know, currently I work in an institute, a research institute which aspires to become a university which only has doctoral programs. It doesn't have master's programs, it doesn't have master's students. Of course, it doesn't have any undergraduate students. So, doctoral programs only. But uh, research and PhD students, more or less common sense says they are synonymous, you know, almost. But, uh, so bringing research and innovation to undergraduate students is a challenge. It's, it's, it's I mean, according to some, it's not very, organic, it's not very natural. It's hard, if not impossible. Uh, you know, in the universities, how it's very crucial to, to bring this to the undergraduate students, which will, uh, you know, foster a, a culture of curiosity, um, critical thinking, a lot of people uh, talk about that, and problem solving. These are skills which are extremely precious in the workspace. How do universities implement this, Atul, uh, in our kind of ecosystem, in our kind of ecosystem? It's not a esoteric phenomenon that we are going to talk about, right? Are these are there examples of, of campuses who have done it better than others? So let's hear from Atul first, yeah. And uh, I will also uh, request my um, distinguished panelists, each one of them, to restrict the response to the first question to five minutes, please. Thank you. So thank you, Sovik. Thank you for putting me at the spotlight, uh, make, making me the first one to speak. The simple answer uh, for your question is, there's a very famous uh, Shah Rukh Khan dialogue, do not underestimate the power of the common Indian. But I'll talk about that. Uh, uh, I'll just like to give a little bit of uh, let me give a bit of what you said about that mic is not working. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I think the first thought I'd like to leave for all of us, and you all know about it. We spoke about it in the morning. 
higher education catalyzes startups and incubates new thoughts, new ideas. There are lots and lots of examples about this. The most exciting example is Silicon Valley, driven by Stanford, UC Berkeley. If you move east, but the high-tech corridor of MIT uh, driving uh, the high-tech corridor of Boston. You come down a little, Princeton, the health, uh, healthcare corridor driven by Princeton. Tsinghua University drives manufacturing. Lots of such examples. So higher ed is extremely, extremely important. University ecosystems are important to, to drive startup ecosystems. Unfortunately, we don't really have that type of hub in India, possibly Bangalore, and we can debate about it. Another statistic I'd like to leave with all of you is, let's take the example of Stanford. Stanford, just Stanford itself last year, or startups coming from Stanford, generated 120 to 125 billion dollars of investments. They were, that's the type of money came in. The total FDI into India was 100. That's the power of just one university. Most deep tech comes from universities. And one more statistic I'd like to give over here, Sauve. If you look at the 135, 138 unicorns that exist in India, only two of them have a deep tech background. Most of them are business models rather than deep tech. So university systems are extremely, extremely important. That's the first thought I'd like to give. So where does this innovation come from? Does it only come from doctoral students, or can we bring it down? Uh, uh, so the simple answer is, my experience is, the younger people are, the more disruptive they think, the more innovative they think, and bringing research right at the lowest level actually adds value. And we have done a bit of experiments. So around, I'll give an example over here of a summit research program that we started at Shulini. So uh, we started working with undergraduate students, putting them into real research projects, and people pretty much laughed at it. Huge success that we got. We then said, Let, can we have school students file patents? And again, we've got some great success. So believe in these students, give them the opportunity, and they'll actually go out and deliver. It's the journey that's more important. So what can universities do? What can institutions do? And I've got six, seven thoughts. I'd like to cover them in the next two minutes. I think the first thing which is very, very important for us, Sovik, is I call break the gates. Unfortunately in India, and I went to an IIT myself, I'm a graduate of IIT Kanpur, we've got in front of our campuses. And we do not allow the ecosystem of an IIT or a top university to interact with the local ecosystem. So my request, sir, is break the gates of IIT Delhi. I tried to get into IIT Delhi last week. I was visiting Delhi. I was stopped. I couldn't enter. As a vice chancellor, I couldn't enter IIT Delhi. Imagine the common guy who's walking down the streets. So that's the first thought I'll have. Second, let's start thinking long term. I think we don't think long term enough. There's this whole thing in India where we say that, what have you done in commercialization? Research and innovation, Sovik, as you know, is very, very long term. Sometimes it takes 20, 25 years to go about actually creating a product. So let's not always be product centric. It's a big jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to solve. And even if you've got the small pieces that uh, students are doing, researchers are doing, let's go out and uh, focus on that. Be innovative. So let's break the value chain. Of course, we don't have money. Of course, uh, the fundings that we have are way smaller. But can we collaborate? And you spoke about it, uh, Sovik. So I'll just take one small example. 90% of capacity in experimentation in the world is actually underutilized. So can you work with foreign universities or Indian universities that have got great capacity? That's something, again, we're doing at Shulini. Uh, we have amongst the highest citations per publication with that. We've got the highest patents coming from these collaborations. Be frugal. Let's not lose the frugality that institutions have. Again, undergraduates can play a great role, Sovik, in bringing that frugality into research. Uh, and finally, catch them young, which is the whole point about young students. So uh, again, I'll just give a last example of Shulini. I think my time is over. But we produced uh, around 1,400 Scopus publications last year. 500 of them actually came from undergraduates. And these are high impact uh, publications. All of them would be probably in journals above two impact factor. So you can encourage students. You can push it down to the uh, UG level. It's a win-win. Undergraduates learn how to problem solve. 
they learn the journey of research and hopefully they'll create unicorns or they'll become great directors in institutions like great institutions like Bits Plan in IIT Delhi. Thank you. Thank you, Atil. Uh, very commendable, you know, the, the number you quoted, uh, undergraduate student-led research uh, getting published in the top journals where PhD students or postdocs publish it. It's, it's, it's tough and uh, it does happen uh, at the system, but I don't think in those numbers, maybe, as a percentage of the total population. Um, we heard about uh, Catchem Young, blend with the neighboring community, uh, break the barriers, break the, you know, bring down the gates, um, <clears throat> break the value chain. These are some of the things I, I yeah, picked up and um, also uh, get into the big jigsaw puzzle, the, the big, large, uh, you know, grand challenge problems and, and so on. Um, thank you, Atul. Uh, uh, great start. Let me uh, move on and uh, so let's see, uh, uh, Atul kind of touched on this a little bit. I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Professor Rangan Banerjee, um, Director IIT Delhi, uh, Professor IIT Bombay. So he, he, I expect him to, if he, if he prefers to bring in examples and, and data points from these two IITs, leading IITs, uh, it, it would not be difficult for him. Uh, so that if there is any learning, uh, if there are examples and, and so on. Uh, also, uh, after I put that question, um, what has worked and what hasn't kind of uh, directions can also be useful for the audience, yeah. So uh, I think uh, the number of uh, about 110 or, or there about some unicorns, uh, uh, two third are in e-commerce, these three verticals, e-commerce, FinTech and enterprise tech. So they, they occupy, uh, Atul was alluding to that. Uh, so what's, uh, in spite of, having these techies around us and the tech schools around us, what stops us from, although the, the number of unicorns and also the number of startups, non-unicorn startups, the Sunicons and, and, and so on, um, they, are, they keep happening. It's a very interesting workspace today. A lot of enthusiasm, a lot of new energy. It's probably good, not quite probably. It is good for the country. Um, and But why deep tech startups are, are few and far between? Why is it that they are all in the deep tech schools? You know, they are some of the best, brightest minds of the country. And what uh, one is, if, if there is some thought on why this is happening, and, and of course, what can improve the situation? We would like to see, because that has a sustainability, that has a, you know, that will have a bigger pie of the business in, in some sense, um, a global impact, so to speak. Why is it that, uh, and, and what can be done by our institutions to have a bigger fraction of deep tech startups in our, either in the, the, in the list of unicorns or in just a list of startups? Rangun, over to you. So good afternoon. I'd like to thank Sovik and Fiki for this opportunity. Uh, there were a number of different questions uh, addressed. But let me start with deep tech and examples of deep tech and incubation of deep tech. Uh, we at IIT Delhi are doing and have a number of examples of startups in the deep tech domain. And the related question, uh, as a proportion of the total number of startups, is other deep tech startups predominant? The answer is, of course, no. And uh, that re relates to the overall ecosystem. Uh, what we have done is we have separate funding and support for deep tech. In addition to the start funding that we have for startups, we have separate funding for proof of concept, which we give to people who come up with ideas where you can make the prototype. We also have, DST has funded a number of centers and these are national centers. We have one of them in our institute, which is the IHFC, the Innovation Hub for Cobotics. And there we have drone related, we have startups which are related. We have Botlab Dynamics, which looks at swarm optimization. Uh, we have a number of 
startups which have come out of the joint technology center that we have with defense and we have we had two of these startups which were actually funded through a new mechanism through idex today what happens is there is a realization and there are many many initiatives for technology related and deep tech related startups the larger question how do we create and enable disruption how do we create and enable startups in the technology domain that is a more tricky one and that needs completely different ways in which we do our education system it needs challenges to students where students find it interesting to work on technology problems and this is where many of our student groups when they come up and they participate in global competitions like the, you have the electric vehicle challenge you have the underwater challenge there's this hyperloop challenge the solar decathlon we find groups which come together they make things they create things and they start working and then they start learning by doing so we have to look at integrating that we also have to have an ecosystem many of the startups it's about the overall ecosystem that we have between industry academia and research organizations we have to have that enabling ecosystem where it's not just enough to look at a product or a prototype but to manufacture that to scale that to create the mechanisms where you have the value supply chain for of that and, and that is so you'll find in batteries you'll find in electric vehicles you'll find in controls when small groups of students start and they come to look at it they try to find things where they can make an impact and the investments are relatively less so we need to create an innovation ecosystem in which the industry the traditional industry is also looking at ways in which they are going to encourage innovation we by i would like so like to respond uh, i mean it may be a, because of security concerns there may be certain things in terms of getting into the institute but we have broken the gates in terms of innovation we have the atal innovation center which is in sonepat not for iit but it is for people from haryana we have a number of other initiatives and in the next time when i get an opportunity we will i'll talk i'll just end here because i i am aware that i am running out of time thank you um thank you rangan um, the you know important thing i picked up is uh, we must do the last mile you know we we have to do the manufacturing as well as the supply chain and so on so that uh, there is a sustained uh, effort toward uh, building up that enterprise all, all the way to the commercial last stage um you know i i'm reminded of uh, an institute i used to work with and uh, let me share some numbers um because i think it's interesting that uh, an organization which doesn't get uh, government support at all it, you know it is important uh, finance is 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 important you can't just say that uh, it's only money no it doesn't work that way it it gets very difficult if you do not get government money um so this institute uh, is is not an iit it's a it's a institute in the private sector and they have as of now according to traction t r a c x n uh it, they have about 1500 uh, uh companies startups and companies uh, uh and 657 or 660 of those are uh, well funded formally officially well funded by at various tiers and levels uh, uh by the vcs and other uh, sources 14 unicorns um uh, from from india and maybe few outside the country uh by graduates of this institute so uh, what i'm trying to say is uh, that's more than 10% india has what about 110 115 so, so this is more than 10% of india's uh, unicorns i think it's commendable that uh you know uh, in the morning we we heard uh, i think uh, shailesh ji uh, secretary general of fiki you know correctly so he he was talking about if if something we do in bangalore and something i think he was talking about jaipur um but this is not even jaipur it's in rajasthan but in a god forsaken you know, backyard of a village 
and and uh, so they are you know these numbers are basically cropping up from such a location so uh, you give bangalore uh, but that that's just one ingredient there are a large number of other ingredients that that go to uh, making an ecosystem successful so i've seen you know this this sort of ecosystem there are so many other things uh, that that uh, are needed um, so i i will uh, you know you're talking about uh, we we heard wrong on about uh, uh, deep tech and and the support uh, that they receive the incentives they receive uh, from uh, iit delhi um, so let me uh, you know uh, change gear and move out of the academia and uh, go to uh, nishit jain uh, he is a special advisor asia of efmd global uh, european union uh, uh, organization um nishit uh, we are talking about uh, uh, you know strategic planning the, the forming the strategy to to create to nurture uh, uh, to uh, curate a uh, uh, ecosystem that will lead to good uh, you know innovation incubation entrepreneurship kind of work canvas uh the question is uh, how could uh, a good strategy lead to great innovation and incubation entrepreneurship um you may respond to the the context of educational institutes and also uh, then maybe veer toward the industry as well um so i i i think uh, he brings in a completely different flavor and a, a, for sure i'll be paying attention to it so uh, because we who are from the academia we have you know certain train of thoughts but uh, i'm i'm sure nishit is going to bring in a completely different mix of uh, of strategies that and and where uh, the technology is going to uh, help in 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 creating this sort of ecosystem nishit over to you thank you avik uh, thank you fikki for inviting me Uh, you know the core word i would say is to have a very clear strategy and a very robust focus uh, let's be clear that uh, in order to create a large ecosystem or an environment which is you know conducive to innovation and entrepreneurship it can't be done alone by iits shulini bits so i mean couple of them represented because these are great schools and they can excel yes but i think in order for a country to move in that direction i think we need a larger goal and a larger strategy so culminating from that i would say that we as a nation i think we have to have a national strategy for innovation and entrepreneurship if we really want to build on it because today what is happening everybody is uh, operating in silos and the word innovation is nothing but collaborative working of uh, minds which come together irrespective of whichever backgrounds and leading to a new change so that's the core so if we uh, break it down i mean today i think we need to bring a uh, change in the culture the way we think the mindset itself and that can happen only when we start to accept i mean in the previous panel i mean we talked about dyslexia we talked about i mean people will with, uh, with different kind of disabilities uh, in the earlier panel with avantika we mentioned about you know the different kind of uh, gender diversity that we need to be inclusive i mean i would like to focus on the fact that let's accept the failure how many of us talk about the failures more than the success the more we talk about our failures i think uh, the one thing one one is sure that once you do a mistake you don't try to do that again at least you are aware of that so you try to learn from it and try to improvise so if we can take cues from that the other aspect is that today's generation i would say is far more uh, at least oriented towards uh, being self employed they are willing to take the risk they are willing to make the change so from that let me take you to a country which is uh, similar to us uh, in a developing space if if we take an example from uh, auc cairo which is one of our member schools and i'll uh, tell you about their journey towards entrepreneur entrepreneurship and innovation so what they did they uh, looked at a horizon of about 5 years in order to create a ecosystem of entrepreneurship and innovation and then they, it's not like a turnkey solution that you just press a button and let's try to do a course and tomorrow we'll be all innovative or we'll be all entrepreneurs or even if we invest money it would not change because the stakeholders are way too many so what they did they realized it's a very large university and a very uh, established university 
they said if we try to do any big change within the university, we're not sure if we can do much. So they had a two-pronged strategy. They said, what can we do within the school and what can we do outside the school? So that was a very clear focus. They started with what they could do outside the school and they said that, okay, let's look at a nationwide development. So they created uh, short micro courses, uh, seminars, conferences, uh, just to educate and uh, get the people excited about this whole ecosystem. You know, what uh, is seen well around I mean, students absorb, faculty absorbs, and then they are more uh, takers to the same. On the parallel, they thought that let's do something similar, I mean, awareness campaign within the ecosystem. So they did a 10 point uh, strategy and quickly just uh, highlight those 10 points. The first one being entrepreneurship and innovation program, uh, which was launched to inspire training of the young minds outside of the school, as I said, uh, with, uh, with a very nominal cost. The next one they did was establish entrepreneurship and innovation council. When these entrepreneurs came together, I mean, they started to create some work and there was some demonstrated uh, success. It led to a council, which was a combination of some stakeholders from the industry, from uh, accelerators, from investors, from donors and others. It then further endorsed uh, and moved on to what they went inside the school called a minor in entrepreneurship. So irrespective of a major, you could subscribe to this. It gets you only additional credits. It does not uh, reduce your credit. And it became kind of a fad and an in thing to have this entrepreneurship course done. And that got a lot of buy-in. They further led to what they said, doing business in Middle East in Africa as a further engagement with certain companies wherein the international global companies came to work with them and that how they can expand their market. They did a two week, three week stint in those uh, geographies. And this became a very popular program. This further led to what they called business and case research center, because now they have uh, consciously demonstrated uh, some used cases so they could measure it through their case center and bring it back to the classroom. Further, this led to a uh, 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 collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which then brought in about 800 to 1,000 companies around them to fund and create a network. This further in, uh, led to some funding which they uh, were able to secure from the university itself and created uh, Egypt's and Cairo's first venture lab, what they call. This was an excellent uh, thing because venture lab was not only cre uh, sort of uh, curating programs for within the uh, university, but also people who would like to pursue some programs from outside and come and benefit from you know, uh, short-term courses. And then finally led to the research. So while research was the goal, right, uh, which was uh, positioned in the beginning, it led to a huge amount of research because there was a great tilt in the faculty mindset that this is becoming an important thing. If I really want to be relevant and meaningful, then I should focus on the research. And Leading this uh, was the last two, which was the Center of Entrepreneurship and Innovation, uh, which became the nodal center by the government of uh, Egypt to, for everybody to come together and benefit from if you do want to do anything in innovation and entrepreneurship. And last but not the least, uh, led to the Angel Network, the Family Business Consortium. And I must uh, mention the fact uh, what uh, Sovik just mentioned in the beginning, a bachelor. You know, this led to a bachelor's degree in entrepreneurship and innovation. Because now you have the network, you have the faculty, you have the research, you have the ecosystem, you have the buy-in, and now you launch the program and it was a big success and it continues to be a landmark uh, thing. So all I would conclude is that we need to have a right strategy, have a vision, and be, I mean, uh, conscious of the fact that it's not gonna happen overnight. Thank you. Thank you, Nishit. Um, let me see if I got the name. AUC Cairo? AUC Cairo is the name of the university. You, know, you may want to explore further. Uh, wonderful learnings. What can we do inside the university and what can we do outside? Um, the, the, the list of strategic. But I, I must also mention that I, I have uh, spoken with uh, a successful uh, you know, startup founders uh, back in Vichpilani for several years. They started their ideas in, in the second year in the dorms and, and, and so on. Some of them become unicorns, etc. This I tossed this idea that do we need a formally structured degree program in, 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 in innovation, entrepreneurship? 
almost unanimous. They said, no, we please don't do that uh, because that will kill the, the various directions of, you know, the, the knowledge and, and the, the training that, uh, that they get depending on the discipline they are in, etc. He said that the, the entrepreneurship, I mean, this sort of formal four years of a structured program is unnecessary, but we do have some, uh, you know, courses, some subjects which are taught over a semester and, and, and so on. Um, you know, I, I, I remember there was one course which is extremely popular. Again, it should not be a core course, you know, because it's not everybody's uh, uh, take, you know, this. Uh, the, the, it's an elective which is extremely popular and which is not taught by a faculty member any of the faculty members from the campus. It's taught by practitioners of entrepreneurship, the, the venture capitalists, the founders, co-founders. And, and you leverage a whole lot on the on the alumni because if your alumni are they're stellar in this workspace, you, 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 you have a wonderful support system. That's what that institute does. So a degree program in entrepreneurship, in my mind, uh, is, is not the right direction. Um, okay, let's go overseas. We have a wonderful uh, a panelist from from um, uh, um, St. Petersburg HSE University, Professor Pavel Kuzmin. Um, am I pronouncing it correctly? All right. Pavel, uh, you are the Deputy Director for Academic Affairs, Affairs and Digital Transformation at your university. I have a, a kind of a, a broad question and, and I want you to address this uh, with, uh, you know, in the context of what is practiced and planned and, and envisaged in your university or in the you know in the community and uh, in your state or country um, uh, i you know i would also like to hear from you what sort of things uh, have worked to achieve the the targeted goal and what hasn't you know if you could uh, you know organize some thoughts on that so i'm i'm asking you to share with us the kind of support system that you would have in your university or in general the universities that you are familiar with in, in your country or beyond um, to, you know, which are these, these support systems are established to nurture startup ventures and, and entrepreneurial initiatives amongst the students, faculty as well, why not, um, within uh, these communities for job creation and development of regional innovation ecosystem. You can stretch it beyond the university as a regional innovation ecosystem if you have such structures at your place. Over to you, Pavel. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. As for instrument, uh, we are uh, focused on three points. Uh, first point is uh, a electronic learning platform. High School of Economics, this is the first uh, university in Russia uh, which has launched an uh, online campus. Uh, we offered uh, 350 courses, uh, including uh, nine concentrations, 21 uh, bachelor's and uh, master's programs, include IT sphere. Second point, use only industry relevant uh, training. At High School of Economics, uh, each program has an academic council. Uh, administrativity, which <clears throat> this administrative uh, body, uh, which, uh, which defines the content of uh, curriculum. The council consists of the representation of the lead big uh, industrial company in Russia, for example, Rostelcom uh, or others, and some uh, international corporation, for example, Huawei. Special center, uh, second point, sorry, uh, this is a special center for uh, environment uh, to encourage uh, 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 students' idea and creative uh, symbiosis with Okay, okay. Result, uh, this is uh, hackathons and competitions. High school, yes. Thank you. 
All Russian Festival of University Technology Projects uh, is the biggest festival of innovative and technology entrepreneurship. In uh, 2023, uh, the festival unites more than uh, 300 uh, peoples uh, from uh, Russians and uh, 17 other countries, uh, including India. More than 4,000 people uh, <coughs> present their project in uh, different industries, for example, medicine, informa information technologies, uh, engineering, uh, retail, development, and other. Usually, festival uh, consists of uh, four stages. And today, in St. Petersburg, uh, our university holds the uh, final of the Thieves Festival. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Um, I think in recent times, India has also gone pretty big on, on hosting events. Uh, AICT, we heard yesterday evening, AICT uh, does a whole lot of uh, hackathons and many of our institutes, uh, they do. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, there's a whole lot of energy in that workspace today, uh, including the amazing enthusiasm amongst our students. Um, let me um, go to, uh, uh, you know, in the first round of questions, the, the, the last uh, panelist. Uh, from the industry, uh, Dr. Bhaskar Roy, uh, Global Operation Leader, uh, Data, Tech, AI of GenPact. Um, um, Dr. Roy, uh, please feel free to add to this, you know, introducing yourself at the beginning of your response. So as, as we have been hearing it, and, and as you have been observing as well, India is, is making uh, good strides. They're making a whole lot of good noise in this uh, innovation incubation workspace, a lot of stats which are in favor of this statement. I, I'm not going to uh, spend time on that. Um, they, and the stats are improving at a fairly uh, sharp gradient, but I must mention that last one year, uh, things have taken a little bit of, you know, I've seen a little bit of slowdown uh, in terms of uh, the gradient and, and so on. So uh, in this uh, sort of conducive environment, while we have been talking about academic campuses, universities, and, 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 and the uh, likes. Uh, I'm, I'm asking you, how does a company like GenPact uh, in particular, and, and other industries in general, which you, you would be able to do that, uh, how do you support the incubators uh, that are operating? The TBI is the technology business incubators operating on our several of our cam campuses. It's been around for what, 10 years at least, uh, maybe longer, uh, 15 years. But I think in the last five, six years, the intensity, the, the activity level have, have uh, improved and, and risen very sharply. Um, how do you motivate the, the bright minds in our dorms, in our hostels, uh, to translate their ideas into game-changing startups and enterprises that are able to do good, do good business as well? So let us uh, hear how the industry can play a pivotal role and help the academic institutes and uh, the ideators, the students. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Fiki, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, I really feel privileged to be a part of the galaxies of academics, academicians, and uh, you know, this is a great topic actually. Uh, my introduction, I've been working in this uh, industry, data science and AI for the last 25 years. Uh, you know, by, uh, by uh, qualification, I'm a PhD in applied statistics and I've been working uh, around, you know, I started, you know, studying statistics and it has moved into data science and now AI and now Gen AI. So things are changing, but the basic concepts are same. Uh, <clears throat> a company like ours, you know, uh, uh, and you know, GenPact is basically a company which was uh, founded by uh, GE, which is a legendary General Electric Corporation. We started as a uh, global business services for uh, GE in way back in 1997. And uh, we became an uh, independent company 90, uh, in 2005, 2006. Uh, so, you know, since that, you know, that, that time nobody has actually heard about, you know, startups or uh, 
you know, entrepreneurship, right? So we uh, we were actually the first generation startups at that point of time in 2005. Uh, we have gone through the cycle and the ecosystem of being a startup. Uh, there were a lot of lot of things which we have learned, and there are a lot of things you know we have. Uh, we we are continuing to help uh, the entire ecosystem so that you know we should be able to uh, help you know others uh, similar kind of a mindset to also come up and you know be successful. Uh, if you basically look at uh, the entire AI data science, uh, you know the entire landscape, uh, most of the startups are basically founded by X Gen factors. Uh, you know, be it Mu Sigma, be it, you know, Bridge I2I, be it uh, MathWork, be it, you know, MathLogic, you know, all big companies and they've been, uh, you know, later, you know, acquired by big companies like ENY, Accenture, etc. So, and they're pretty, pretty successful. So, uh, in my opinion, whenever, you know, this culture is started by people who have some kind of experience and they have gone through that entire life cycle of being being a startup i think the probability of getting successful is much more than uh, people just coming out of college and you know starting a new venture so i think very very important is that our education system also also needs to mirror uh, you know that kind of a experience led education for people if they want to really start uh, you know want to basically be entrepreneur after finishing of the colleges so very important uh, and unfortunately today uh, we have around uh, more than 50,000 colleges, institutes and universities uh, in India and you know everybody who is giving a degree says you know they are they are they are categorized as a higher education institute everybody claims to be world class uh, but the point is uh, what is the definition of world class world class is you know when you have the world-class facilities, when you have the world-class students, when you have the world-class teachers, educators, when you have the world-class world -class research and innovation centers, right? But, you know, if you basically look at this, apart from, you know, IIT and Shulinis and, you know, VIT of the world and some even NITs of the world, 90% of them basically lack the basic infrastructure. So, you know, on one hand, we also are saying that we will, you know, through our education system, will grow this entire, you know, startup ecosystem. But the, on the other hand, there is a huge, uh, you know, huge development need to, uh, you know, pump up that applied portion into our education system. Uh, in most of the higher colleges, you know, they are still following the 19th century, you know, syllabus in 21st century world. And, you know, because they have to realize, you know, the entire academic, uh, you know, the, the academic council has to realize that they cannot basically keep on teaching the same academic, uh, you know, courses, you know, for for last three decades. And they they think that, you know, their students will start, you know, behaving like, a, you know, uh, as, as some, some of the top, top notch uh, technocrats and top notch, you know, scientists in the world. I mean, that will not happen. So uh, what we do you know, as an organization within Genpact is, we have created an ecosystem uh, where uh, we have long-term partnership with premium institutes like, you know, IIM Bombay, which was earlier known as NITI, uh, IIT Hyderabad, where, you know, we are working with their research students, I mean, people who are pursuing PhDs and postdoctorals. Uh, it's a long-term program where we are sponsoring them uh, you know, and uh, for entire four or five years of their research uh, and, you know, co-innovating with them. So, you know, they are, most of them are freshers. We are also working with them, you know, as, you know, as mentors, as consultants to help them to, you know, basically uh, expedite that innovation cycle. So, and, and, and the best way, best thing is, you know, they're not basically working on uh, any, any fictional problem. They are basically working with the real problem of the industry. It could be a supply chain issue or a logistics issue for some of the big manufacturing organization. It could be a digital marketing for some some of the big re retail giants. So they are basically working on some real, you know, complex problem, and we are helping them to solve it. Uh, you know, through that you know entire cycle of four to five years. During this course, many of them basically get an opportunity to work very closely with the client. So if the client is based out of U.S. or Europe or other countries 
these people you know work there, there with with the client as an employee so that basically gives a lot of exposure for them to really understand and you know experience the first hand nuances of a business which definitely is very very helpful for them you know when they come back finish up their phd's and these people definitely while doing their phd's they have learned the art of uh, you know kind of solving a complex problem uh, you know uh, by by themselves so this kind of a program and then you know we also have introduced a long term internship program which is more than 6 months where you know people i mean most of the mba grads or you know or post graduate people they don't come for two months only because you know we we want them for a longer period of time so that you know they, we should be able to teach them and help them to you know come up the curve so uh, and and also you know also uh, helping some of the institutes to be part of their academic curriculum and uh, you know uh, influencing their coursework so that you know they get get the more applied portion into their studies so that's that's where you know we are also helping the education so the academic and corporate collaboration to you know bring up this ecosystem thank you thank you dr Roy. um co innovation um between industry and academia i uh, my experience you know i i agree with uh, the last comment you made i i have spoken with a large number of students who uh, in that institute uh, the this the the internship it's called practice school it's for a full semester in the 22 weeks and uh, uh, it's a transformation a lot of people a uh, lot of students uh, said that after that experience it, it's in the final year um the the not only the the technology exposure the work specific the the business exposure as well so uh, people who are getting into enterprise creation it's a wonderful uh, training it's a wonderful exposure for many of them um i i'm go i'm going to go to uh, uh, rangon again um with a, a different kind of questions um while uh, high end research which we usually associate with uh, you know i asked him about deep tech now it's a flip flip question uh, while high end research can and can provide and does provide a solid foundation successful incubators also require a supportive ecosystem mentorship industry connections vc capital you know it's a long list and a commitment to fostering entrepreneurship on campuses now the question is universities without a primary focus on high end research can they still play a pivotal role in creating an environment that nurtures innovation and entrepreneurship obviously this question uh, doesn't uh, uh, you know refer to an iit or and, and so on so Uh, the institutes uh, can a university not involved in high end research can they still operate successfully uh, incubator a simple answer according to me is yes um, the focus has to be on problem solving on understanding and choosing relevant problems and uh, science engineering colleges or even others universities and in the in their ecosystem if you if we can encourage students and faculty members to focus on real problems to choose the kind of problems that they would like to work on and uh, you know getting improvements in society and seeing that we create knowledge is one of the important goals of any higher education system uh, so yes when when we talk of i don't know what is low end and high end these classifications themselves are problematic for me uh, because if you think of you know you look at uh, the wastes which are going out you create a biogas plant practically there is it may seem simple if you want to try and model it and solve the equations it's as complicated as designing a nuclear power plant um, so these are all mindset issues uh, but i think even when we look at systems if we want to try and make things it's a way of thinking when we talk about innovation and incubation and we have to encourage the the way of thinking to 
choose the correct problems to work on and i don't think that is the prerogative of uh, institutions which have more infrastructure it's it is something which has to be a, an inbuilt part of any education system i couldn't agree with you more um uh, no matter how much we try the the number of sort of non deep tech startups are, are still going to come in in good numbers and there the the research component and the background uh, may not be as helpful anyway so um good um let me um, go to atul again and uh, i don't know I, I i have to i want to take questions from the audience maybe this is the last bit and then um we'll we'll invite questions and um, considering the amount of time left um atul uh, uh, i'm trying to reflect on on, on what has changed in the let me take a longer, I know, a, a, a wider window. Uh, let's say 15 years in this country, or maybe 10 years, um, where uh, the needle of industry academia is pointing now. Uh, given that innovation is the agenda of the nation, seems like, and uh, doing reasonably well, I suppose. So, in this uh, perspective, what are the historical impediments? barriers and have these uh, barriers remain or have the challenges been uh, remain the same or have they been alleviated to some extent let's uh, hear some on in these directions the barriers and how where is that that needle now or going to be in the near future so we spoke about this in the in the morning uh, sovik and if i am blunt i think we do not know how to work with industry and industry does not know how to work with academia and that's the truth truth uh you know, lots of, lots of discussions that have but at the end of the day there is a huge trust between academia and industry today so i just i spent many many years with mckinsey so i understand both sides of the coin and i think the fundamental challenge in the way industry thinks and the way academia thinks so industry think weeks and academia thinks 3 years and i'll give a classical example over here i am on the board of a very large textile company vardhaman and they solution for removing dyes out of uh, out of water for example and they said we want a solution and uh, the ceo was looking at a simple solution probably a 4 to 6 week answer and when I took it to my researchers, they started thinking, about, you know, an all singing, all dancing answer, probably a PhD coming out of it. And I think that's the first challenge. Uh, the second challenge is mutual respect. So academicians do, if I use the word, do not care about uh, industry. They think that frivolous things happen in industry. There's also this very social mindset in India where they say that, okay, all these guys who wanted to make money ended up in industry and industry people think that all research that happens in uh, all the institutions is useless when we heard uh, Dr. Roy speak, allude to that a little bit and I keep on having these debates with I think which is uh, can we just start talking to each other, can we just start meeting uh, in a form, in an informal way, just have a drink with each other, and we'll get to know each other. And I think those type of things will will, will break the barrier. I think uh, uh, what I'd like to also comment on what uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee spoke about. Uh, it's also about imbibing industry culture inside academia in a uh, in a in a bigger way. So when we speak about entrepreneurship, for example, Sovik, uh, entrepreneurship is actually not about the problems that you that you give in the class. So there's a very famous a song of Pink Floyd that all of us used to sing at IIT, uh, leave them kids alone. So bring a culture of freedom uh, to the students. So again, I don't want to comment on uh, uh, what the IITs are doing, but I strongly believe that you just got great kids into IITs and that's why they delivered. A lot of the unicorns are coming because you gave them the freedom to think. Just let them go out and do their own stuff, interact with the industry, 
and it's these students because you asked me this question let these students go out and in their own free way experiment with what's happening around them in their ecosystem let them go out and you know walk the streets of uh, safdarjang or chandni chowk or whatever and they'll find answers and they'll find solutions and i think that's the type of freedom we need to give to students and once that happens you'll see these students becoming uh, industry stalwarts uh, the last thought i'd like to say is that we live in a world of absolute disruption i don't think we know the answers better than the young kids so they know it better than us and once we do that you'll see you know all the culmination of all the type of different things we're talking happen um thank you uh, atul uh, we uh, you know talking about uh, giving freedom to the students uh, the institute which has produced so far uh, 14 unicorns uh, the the policy formal official written down policy is zero attendance policy the students uh, need not attend a minimum number of classes or anything of that sort lot of uh, uh, unicorn founders and and successful uh, sunicorn founders i have spoken to they attributed uh, the opportunity to ideate and pursue it while they are still in college in the dorms was that particular policy they said now this is very very debatable issues are you going to uh, you know support this uh, in you know, i think regulatory bodies I, i i know that particular institute uh, quite often is to get phone calls that uh, share your attendance records and and so on and i i went through all kinds of things but but then um um these are uh, issues that you adapt to your own system etc there is no uh, we shouldn't follow any prescriptive route uh, route at all um uh, we promise that we will uh, close the session in, in on time um so right now i'm going to the audience and if necessary uh, if we i have a, a few couple of minutes left i will go to uh, one of my panelists for another question if if me if i get that opportunity but let's uh, hear from you uh, uh, make sure that you know uh, you just ask a question for the panelist if you prefer a particular panelist you you say that otherwise you know they will volunteer and and uh, make sure that it, it you keep it brief and uh, we want to hear more from the panelists yeah not working okay thank you sir thanks everybody for a uh, interesting discussion sovik sir i'm product of your zero attendance and i'm product of your uh, conquest and e cell i run a startup in education called career guide so your zero attendance policy uh, the session is about startup entrepreneurship creativity in academia uh, and to all the stellars academicians here My question is do we have something inside your institution where we check that your incubation centers are not producing one more game which world does a need one more more photo filters which world does a need or one more 10 minutes delivery which world does a need so do we have something inside your incubation centers or in your entrepreneurship studies policy where we are talking about changing world pressing problems and creating them we would love to hear about it who want to take this ramon yeah i'll take a minute out sure why do you start go ahead, go ahead. so i think uh, you know this is a tricky thing we see what happens is whenever we at iit delhi uh, look at any proposal for incubation or a startup we do have a we create a group which includes people from the domain and then we look at the viability of the idea we look at what is the originality the, having said that when you look at the entire set of things which are coming up for incubation and the ideas some of these me too kind of things do come so it's uh, you know you you want to create a large set of you want to be supportive you want to see that if there is a reasonable idea you work with the group you suggest to them you orient them in a certain way and it's uh, it is also it's also about the motivation that you have for young people to give the startup or motivation will be because you want to be a unicorn because that's hype or the motivation is an intrinsic motivation because you want to s- solve and understand the problem you want to do an incremental thing or you want to see that your problem really has a, a market so 
there's no easy answer to your question. Uh, we are aware of it. And we are doing, for instance, now in our innovation ecosystem, we have more than 100 startups already. In our, on our Housecast campus, we also have the Atal Innovation Center on Sonipat. We've invited a whole group of our alumni who have been venture capitalists and startup founders to do a critical analysis of our innovation and incubation system. Uh, interact with our startups and they've made a presentation, they are going to look at it. So it's a question where we need to understand that we're doing something, but we need to do much more. And we need to actually look at the entire ecosystem. We successful if we can create an innovation ecosystem and we have to look at how much employment we we have to look at different metrics and what is the what's the impact that our startups have made in the region and so we are on that journey but we of course need inputs and i don't think uh, i don't think we pass all the box i mean we don't we tick some of the boxes but i think we, there's much more to do yeah, before I go to Atul on this, um, let me also make a comment that, uh, you know, uh, more often than not, unfortunately, um, what is desirable in terms of a type of enterprise and type of uh, whatever product or technology that you are developing uh, and what is going to be successful as a business venture and what will attract the VC money, there is a conflict quite often. Unfortunately, you know it better than any of us. Um, but but then if we follow that track, everything is lost. Right? I mean, we can't just do it for business only. But we need to keep that in mind. There has to be some decent balance, I suppose. But unfortunately, that contradiction, that conflict does remain. All right. Uh, absolutely, Solvik. So first of all, there's no bad or good idea. Even your photo frame, if successful, will add GDP to the country. So I think that's the first point I'd like to make. But I think as institutions, we can nudge students towards a particular direction. Nishit spoke about the strategy of the higher ed institution. I can give an example of Shulani, for example. Uh, we have very specifically laid out five specific areas of research and innovation. Water, clean energy, food, cancer, nanotech. So these are very clearly five areas. And if you think about water, for example, it starts from chemistry, goes into biology, goes into machine learning, artificial intelligence, economics, and then finally, uh, social problems. So all of these would be transdisciplinary and hopefully during the four years or three years or two years at the university, they'll get interested in solving some of these topics. So I think our role is to nudge students. Our role is not to sort of push them in a particular direction. Some will choose the path of becoming rich, but let, uh, like Jeff Bezos said, uh, it's the missionaries and the mercenaries who try to be rich. Unfortunately for the uh, mercenaries, the missionaries end up actually making the money too. So be the missionary and do your work. You'll become a unicorn too. Thank okay. You. Um, a question over there. Um, I'm going to go to Nishit on this question, irrespective of what the question is. Let's see. We'll, we'll try so that everybody gets an opportunity to speak on, on in this round. Um, Can I speak? We need to be quick. And uh, I think you scream. That's the only solution. Hello. In absence of a microphone. Yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ganeev Chadda. I'm from the EY Parthenon team. So we had worked on the report. So I just wanted to ask a question related to the innovation and entrepreneurship outcome. So we interacted with a lot of universities, some of which are on the panel right now. And I think one of the things we saw is when you look, you know, maybe high up in the NIRF rankings, you see that the number of startups incubated, the number of patents published and things like that, they have generally very high outcomes. And then when you go to maybe lower ranked universities and maybe certain non-ranked universities, what you see is these innovation outcomes start to drastically drop. So I think it's great to, you know, talk about innovation and entrepreneurship and how we can address that at the top institutions. But I mean, what's the future for the country for addressing it at the lower ranked or non-ranked institutions? So one of the things we talked about is maybe partnerships with the higher ranked or top institutions, right? but boosting this innovation culture at the lower ranked institutions is equally important. So I just wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Um, okay, so if, I, if I may just comment before you start, you know, uh, 
it, it, it really is absolutely all right. As a matter of fact, quite a few of uh, students from well-known campuses, they have gone to independent incubators after they graduated or even while they are studying, not necessarily the institute incubator. So, and they have been successful also. So all these models exist. Similarly, uh, uh, institute incubator, they do welcome and, and permit other uh, incubates uh, from other organizations and institutes to to uh, do the incubation in the that institute. All these models are working. Yeah. So I would just, uh, I mean, take it further from there and I would say remember the three C's, the collaborate, conceive, create. I mean, and uh, when you collaborate, conceive and create, I think if you follow this model uh, religiously, you would uh, end up uh, doing remarkable work. To give you an example today, I mean, you don't need to necessarily look for a rank on an accreditation or a nature of the institution, as long as that makes sense for what you intend to do and where you are heading. How would you do that? I think the solution, a cost-effective solution is digitalization. Today, the metaverse is changing. The way we are learning, the way we are exchanging is changing. So today with AI, I mean, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, you have the VR, you have the metaverse, you have the crowdsourcing. I mean, all of these things will lead you to collaborate with things and have a very personalized approach, have a very immersive learning experience, and also connect with leaders who you could not probably approach in the uh, pre-pandemic, if, if I were to say, because now there's a huge cultural acceptance of digitization per se. And this is not just, I mean, connecting with those, this is also about uh, understanding problems and challenges of those geographies. So the problem may not necessarily be within your ecosystem, but maybe operating in a very different geography altogether, but you may have a solution. So it is a win-win if you collaborate with the ecosystem using technology is what my recommendation would be. I think you're absolutely right that, you know, we need to focus on looking at That goes uh, uh, that that goes to various institutions. We are uh, doing. Uh, we have a scheme called the Unnat Bharat Abhiyan, where we link up with uh, seventeen thousand villages. Uh, it's a national initiative with three thousand plus uh, universities and engineering colleges, and then each. So it's a hub and spoke model, and in each region. Each of these institutions is connected to a set of villages where you have students going out and then identifying problems, whether it is related to water, whether it is related to energy. And the whole idea is to understand that we are doing things for the real world. Once you do that, you can decide whether your ecosystem is the immediate boundary or the things and then focus on it and then prioritize. So there is no reason why any educational institution should not have that, but it needs some orientation. It will also need some support. It will need some basics in some of the domains. So it's linked with quality, but it's also linked with an intent to be able to work on real problems. And I think one of the things that the ministry has been talking to us now is to look at how we can go in phase two of the Unnat Bharat Abhiyan and focus on looking at innovation and looking at linking up with the Atal Innovation Centers. Um, so I think what you're saying is absolutely right if we want to look at. And uh, you would know that in IIM Ahmedabad, you know, the, um, the Professor Anil Gupta, they started looking at grassroots innovation and then seeing how those can be supported and strengthened by student projects. And that was a very interesting kind of thing. So I, I think there's a lot more that we can and do, and we right. need to we need not we <clears throat> need to not talk just about the IITs and the Bates and the IIMs, but we need to look at the entire uh, ecosystem, the university system that we have. Thank you, Rangan. Um, I am afraid uh, I can't take any more questions from the audience. Uh, we just have one and a half minute left, um, so I, I can't do a closing com uh, summary either, I won't, but I, instead of that, uh, I will mention a, a new uh, research and, and necessarily incubation and innovation as well, model that, that's coming up in the horizon. I, let me share this. Uh, it's not very popular yet. 
Uh, this is primarily in, in terms of uh, collaborating with uh, overseas organizations, uh, international institutes. So it's talking about co-working co space. So creating a physical working space in your campus in India, uh, which is going to be uh, you know, where the other university overseas will be working. As a matter of fact, there will be commercial uh, agreements that the, the overseas university will probably pay rent for that. So it's a little bit of, a, of the international university, a little bit of that physically present in your campus and a little bit of you, your university in a reciprocal manner in that other university. Unless we do this, the, the collaboration remains a bit superficial, I mean, a bit, bit of a gloss over. So this is something which is, is beginning to happen. And, and this is something uh, that I think will also have a transformative effect, uh, particularly in some institutes who are able to do this. And the overseas universities, particularly the American universities are up for it. They are going ahead with a very commercial understand, you know, agreement on, on both sides. And, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting twist and uh, I, I think Nishit has a very quick comment, half a minute, Nishit. Just a very quick comment on enforcing that. I think UK Wales has done something similar. They have a 4C approach, cluster Beautiful. catalyst, yeah. uh, 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 cluster catalyst, it was capacity building yeah. and also about, uh, you know, commons. So whatever is common, you share, you create a cluster, you bring yeah. the catalyst from the industry. And you it's make a it physical work. presence. So UK Wales other, is doing this uh, place, same yeah. thing similar. And, and it has to be reciprocal as well. So uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful panelists, my distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, good friends. Uh, beautiful answers. I, I couldn't have done without you. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. I hope uh, it has you know, added something in your uh, thought process uh, that you go back with. And uh, I conclude the session thanking Fiki for giving us this opportunity and, and the audience, wonderful audience, beautiful questions as well. Uh, wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, let's once again put our hands together for that wonderful interactive panel discussion session we had. As I request all our panelists to kindly come together for a group photograph. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, with that, we will now be having a short uh, tea break. The next session will commence from 4.15 p.m. I request everyone to be back and seated in time. But before you all proceed for tea, I have a few announcements to make. From 7 p.m. in the evening, we will have our awards presentation ceremony. And tomorrow morning from 9 a.m. onwards, we will have the B2B meetings. All those interested to attend the B2B meetings are requested to be here in time. The B2B meetings are scheduled on the first floor. And ladies and gentlemen, at 10.30, we have a very important session where Secretary Higher Education, uh, Government of India, will be addressing the August House. We all request, we request you all to be seated here by 10.30 when the secretary is here with us. Thank you very much indeed. Please enjoy your cup of tea and coffee and be back in time for the next session at 4.15. Thank you. <laughs>